Hey everyone, Victor is here, your organic chemistry tutor, and today I want to talk about the nomenclature of alkynes. Alkynes are unsaturated hydrocarbons that contain at least one carbon-carbon triple bond, like that. They play a critical role in field of organic chemistry and, by extension, are important for any health sciences and pre-medical studies for several reasons. Alkynes are biologically relevant, they are synthetically versatile, and they have a lot of real-world applications. And, of course, you'll need to be able to name alkynes for the test. And in this video we'll cover precisely that, how to name alkynes and cycloalkynes, and we'll also discuss the edge cases that will definitely trip you up on the test if you are not prepared. So grab your cup of coffee and notebook to work through the examples with me, hit that like button for good luck on the test and let's get started! As a functional group, alkynes have an ending "-ine", with a Y, so Y and E. So whenever we are going to be naming our alkynes, the name will end with the "-ine". And as in any case with naming molecules, we are going to start by identifying the longest continuous chain containing triple bond for any kind of molecule that we want to name containing a triple bond. So in this example I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, so I have 9 carbons. Next, we'll need to number our chain, giving the lowest possible locant or a number to our triple bond. In this example, we'll have to number our molecule from the left side. This would give number 3 to the first carbon of the alkyne. If I were to number it from the other side, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, like that, I would end up with the carbon number 6, where the alkyne is, which is obviously larger, and in that case, that would obviously not be correct. In case where we have multiple possibilities, multiple different ways of numbering our molecule, we'll go with our normal tiebreakers, where we would first look at the position of other groups, and if we still have no difference there, we'll look at the alphabetical order at that point. Next, after we have our numbering, we're going to identify and alphabetize our substituents. Here I have two methyl groups at the positions 2 and 7, so I'm going to say that this is going to be a 2,7-dimethyl, and I want to remind you here that the numerical prefix di is not counted for the alphabetical order, it's just there to tell us that we have two methyl groups. This means that we are only going to consider the first level M for the methyl here. We also have a chlorine atom in this molecule as well, in the 8th position. So we are going to call it 8-chloro. And remember, in the final name, we are going to alphabetize our substituents regardless of their position in the molecule. I know it might not be very logical, but that's what the rules are, and we gotta follow those rules. Next, remember to indicate the position of the triple bond in our parent molecule. Here, the triple bond starts from the third atom, which which means that our parent is going to be non 3 ion. And finally, we are going to put it all together, getting 8 chloro 2 7 dimethyl non 3 ion. If I have any stereochemistry, like let's say chiral atoms, for instance, then we are going to mention those stereodescriptors at the beginning of the name, like we would normally do for any other molecule. So if, let's say, I were to add stereochemistry to this molecule, add the stereochemistry at my chiral carbons, uh, let's say something like this, then after assigning my R and S stereodescriptors, we are going to get the R stereodescriptor for the atom with the methyl group and the S stereodescriptor for the atom with the chlorine, which would give me 7R8S8Chloro27Dimethyl non 3 ion as my final name. Make sure you know how to assign your stereodescriptors and you can do it reliably. At this point in your course, I am willing to bet that those are going to be a fair game on the test, and if I only had a quarter for every time one of my students told me that they, you know, lost points on the exam because they forgot about their stereodescriptors. Boy, I think I would be already paying off my mortgage by now, but I digress. Now, let's look at a few examples here. In the first molecule, I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So I have 8 carbons in my longest chain containing the triple bond. Next, when it comes to the numbering, uh, there are two possible ways how I can number this molecule, and in both cases I'm going to get alkyne at the carbon number 4, regardless of how I would number my chain. And we know that in the cases like that, in the cases of ambiguity, we are going to look at tiebreakers. 
like let's say the positioning of our groups. And as a last resort, if we don't see the difference there, we're going to look at the alphabet. Here I number my chain from the left and this will give me two substitutions at the third position. If I were to number it from the right side, from the opposite side, I would get one substitution in the third position and two substitutions in the sixth position, which is not as good. So next, my substitutions, I have two ethyl groups in the third and sixth positions and a methyl group in the third position. Thus, I'm going to get 3,6-diethyl-3-methyl-oct-4 there are no stereocenters in this molecule, so I don't need to indicate any stereochemistry here. Now, in my next example, I definitely do have stereochemistry, so I'll have to indicate that one for sure. My longest chain here is going to be six carbons. And since in this case my aromatic ring is a substituent, I'll have to number from that position since it's literally in the position number one. And, well, you cannot go any lower than one. I also have the isopropyl and chlorine as my substituents. And I'll remind you that the prefix iso is counted for the alphabetical order here, which means that by putting my name together I'll have 5 chloro, 3 isopropyl, 1 phenyl, hex, 1 ion. And of course, since I have two chiral carbons in this molecule, at the positions 3 and 5, I'll have to assign the corresponding stereo descriptors to those as well. In this case, both stereo descriptors are R, so my final name would be 3R5R5Chloro3Isopropyl1Phenylhex1 ion. Now, how exactly are we going to deal with a cyclic alkyne like what I have in my third example? Well, like any other cyclic molecule. Since we do have a functional group here, we gotta number our alkyne in such a way as to give the lowest possible number to our functional group, which in this case is a single functional group in a cycle, so that will give uh, us a number one at the alkyne and we'll have to start numbering from there. So here I'll number my molecule this way. Remember, just like in the case of the alkenes, I always have to number through my pi bond, so in either this direction or the opposite direction. And never start at one atom of the triple bond and then go to the other direction. Always, and I repeat, always number through the triple bond. And of course, we gotta number our molecule to give the lowest possible numbers to our substituents, making it so I have to number clockwise in this particular case. And the final name for this molecule is going to be 4,4-dichloro-7,7-dimethyl undesign. Notice I'm not specifying where my triple bond is in this case. Since in the cyclic molecule the numbering will have to start from the triple bond anyways, saying the atom where the uh, triple bond is going to be is, well, redundant. So we're not going to do it. Also, this molecule doesn't have any stereochemistry whatsoever, so there is nothing to name from that perspective either. And before I flip the page, I also want to mention that I always add locants, or numbers, directly before the functional group. This is the current IOPAC preferred name, or PIN for short, and you can also see the version where the locant uh, for the in or the ein suffixes are uh, placed in front of the parent's name. So, for instance, for the first one, instead of saying oct for ein, I could say for octine. Or for the second one, instead of saying hex one ein, I could potentially say one hexine. However, this is an outdated practice and it is no longer recommended for use by the IUPAC. All right, so here is a tricky part. What if we have a double bond and a triple bond in the molecule at the same time? Well, we gotta have the ending in for my double bond and the ending ein for my triple bond. But uh, what about the rest? Well, my friends, I have good news and I have bad news. And the good news is that the IUPAC rules are very clear how to deal with this. The bad news is, however, is that the rules have changed a few times over the past 30 years and not every instructor got the memo, so to speak. So I'm going to tell you how the current rules, which is 2013 rules as of the time of this recording, how those rules deal with this. However, I want you to double check with your instructor how they want to approach that. At the end of the day, it's not me who is going to be giving you the final grade, so better be safe than sorry. Although, I can tell you that the standardized tests like ACS or MCAT will use the rules that I am about to tell you here. So, without any further ado, 
if you have a double bond and a triple bond, and those bonds would be getting the same number, prioritize the double bond, which means that the correct name for this molecule is going to be non 2 in 7 ion and not the other way around, not non 7 into ion. If your double and triple bond would get different numbers, depending on which end of the molecule you start numbering from, prioritize whichever would get the lowest number. So, in this molecule, for instance, it's going to be hept 4 in 1 ion. The triple bond gets the lowest number. While in this case, it's going to be DAC 3 in 6 ion. The double bond here gets the lower number. Well, questions, comments, suggestions, leave them in the comments below. Thank you for watching and special thanks to all Organic Chemistry Tutor members and donors for your continuous support and encouragement. You guys are awesome. Watch this video next and I will see you tomorrow.